over the last few weeks, uh, we were discussing uh, certain maybe strictly um, cinematic devices, such as editing or cinematography. Um, today, we are going to discuss narration. Uh, and it's something that cinema shares with other um, storytelling arts, such as literature or theater. Uh, still, there are certain things that are unique to, to cinematic techniques. Uh, knowing that, for example, in movies, the camera is the primary narrator. We're going to discuss mostly fictional uh, elements of uh, narrative or narration in fictional films today. But uh, before uh, that, uh, you should know that uh, cinema is always a narrative medium. And it's just because of, because of the fact that it's, it's a temporal medium, uh, it always um, employs narrative techniques and, and certain elements of narration. Uh, so documentary films are scripted. Uh, they, um, without any um, uh, elements of narration, documentary films would be as dull as those uh, uh, images uh, captured by the security cameras in the grocery stores. So um, knowing that experimental films, art films, and documentary films, they all uh, employ um, elements of narrative techniques. Um, so uh, what is a narration? So narration is the act of telling the story. And the narrator is who or what tells the story. So in cinema, we, we can use a number of things, number of perspectives, flashbacks that explain the character's past, voiceover. So there are all different approaches to story. And or one thing that um, um, makes cinema unique is the multiplicity of perspectives. Not that in literature or novels we don't have a, a, some sort of a polyphonic uh, way of storytelling, but usually that is done in a very complicated ways by writers such as Nabokov or uh, James Joyce. This is um, can can be achieved in a very digestible way in cinema. The voiceover can say something, and the camera is telling us something else, uh, and so. Uh, let's talk about uh, one fact. We have voiceovers, we have characters telling the stories in the movies, and usually they borrow those techniques from literature. But uh, once again, uh, in every movie, the camera is the primarily narrator. So its narration consists of many visual elements it captures and arranges in every composition, in every shot. Uh, so the kind of have um, uh, the, uh, the camera is uh, helping uh, the audience to, to create the, the story. Um, however, camera is not always a movie's only narrator. Editing, for example, is an important element of storytelling, so how we put the images together. Um, so in literature, traditionally, we have um, three modes of narrative, first person narrator, third-person narrator, and omniscient uh, narrator. Uh, so the first person is, uh, we, we kind of read everything, um, all uh, the, the mental impulses of the, uh, the first person, or just how he uh, describes his own story. The third person is when a character, not the central character, uh, a secondary character, who is not actually important in the story is telling uh, the story of usually the, 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 the central character. An example of that is The Great Gatsby. So Nick uh, is, uh, is the storyteller, but it's not his story. It's actually the story of Gatsby. So, and omniscient is someone who is not part of the, the story, but knows everything about it. it it's like some sort of God's um, a point of view uh, narration. So to, an example of uh, omniscient uh, uh, can be seen in the, the movie Royal Tenenbaum um, by Wes Anderson, um, showing the, uh, the opening scene. The summer house on Eagles Island. Hold it, Chazzy. Hold it right there. What are you doing? You're on my team. <laughs> there are no teams. 
the BB was still lodged between two knuckles in Chas's left hand. Margot Tenenbaum was adopted at age two. Her father had always noted this when introducing her. This is my adopted daughter, Margot Tenenbaum. She was a playwright and won a Braverman grant of $50,000 in the ninth grade. So what you see that the narrator is not part of the film, is not in the film, has no interest. Uh, like it just, he knows uh, that that voiceover knows everything about every characters more than even the, the characters in the film. Hi, you lie. You said I could run away too. No, I didn't. And don't tell anyone you saw us. They shared a sleeping bag and survived on crackers and root beer. Four years later, Margot disappeared alone for two weeks and came back with half a finger missing. Richie Tenenbaum had been a champion tennis player since the third grade. He turned pro at 17 and won the U.S. Nationals three years in a row. He kept the studio in the corner of the ballroom, but had failed to develop as a painter. Up. Up. Right. Perfect. On weekends, Royal took him on outings around the city. <laughs> These invitations were never extended to anyone else. So uh, back to our, uh, my first point about multiplicity of perspectives in cinema. And so even when we have a first person narrator, actually usually we don't employ that voiceover in, in, through the entire uh, story. And I said that usually we have a number of devices in cinema that they also tell us stories. So I'm going to show um, uh, a scene from American Psycho. So it's a uh, first person narrative is actually uh, kind of adapted from a novel uh, that uh, employs a first person narrative. But the scene that you're going to watch, you would see the difference between the camera narrator and a first person uh, narrator. You hear the voiceover of Bateman's first person narrators, uh, Bateman's character in this scene and how he's very much uh, concerned and obsessed about business card. But what the camera reveals to us uh, is that all these um, cards are very similar. It seems that just the names are different, even the phone numbers, so they're exact same cards. So um, these confuse people and they also misrecognize each other. Uh, so the, the use of voiceover narration, first person uh, voiceover narration is very ironic um, in that scene uh, because uh, it's not necessarily the sentiment uh, that the film uh, is trying to, to pass on. So you see the, a, a clear uh, difference between a first person narrator and how the camera uh, narrates uh, the scene. Thanks for looking after Courtney. Dorcia, how impressive. How on earth did you get a reservation there? Lucky, I guess. That's a wonderful suit. Don't tell me, don't tell me, let me guess. Mm, Valentino Couture. Uh -huh. You look so soft. Your compliment was sufficient, Louis. Hello, Halber Stram. Nice tie. How the hell are you? Alan has mistaken me for this dickhead, Marcus Halberstram. It seems logical because Marcus also works at PNP and in fact does the same exact thing I do. He also has a pension for Valentino's suits and Oliver Peoples' glasses. Marcus and I even go to the same barber, although I have a slightly better haircut. So how's the ransom account going, Marcus? It's, uh, it's all right. Really? That's interesting. It's not, uh, it's not great. Oh, well, you know. So how's Cecilia? She's a great girl. Oh, yeah. I'm very lucky. Mm -hmm. Hey, Alan. Congratulations on the Fisher account. Thank you, Baxter. Listen, Paul, squash. Call me. What, Friday? No can do. I got an 8.30 res at Dorcia. Great. Sea urchin ceviche. Dorcia on Friday night. How do you swing that? 
I think he's lying. Um, and actually, just to connect it to, to the topic of last week, um, sound, the use of sound in film, just uh, tr uh, uh, kind of pay attention to the sound of the, the, the cases, the card cases. Uh, it's actually like the uh, Japanese swords. So the, the masculine rivalry between them uh, is actually the, is, is shown through this uh, kind of very interesting, maybe exaggerated to the use of the sound. Uh, so there is this like a really like the kind of masculine fight uh, or, or between um, uh, these characters uh, in, in such an environment. Uh, so yeah, also well, kind of that's um, an interesting point, but again, uh, uh, pay attention to the voiceover uh, as well. No can do. I got an 830 res at Dorcia. Great sea urchin ceviche. Doors on Friday night. How do you swing that? I think he's lying. Is that a gram? New card. What do you think? Woohoo. Very nice. Look at that. Picked them up from the printers yesterday. Good coloring. That's bone. And the lettering is something called Cillian Braille. It's very cool, Bateman, but that's nothing. Look at this. That is really nice. Eggshell with Romalian type. What do you think? Nice. Jesus. <laughs> that is really super. How did a nitwit like you get so tasteful? <laughs> I can't believe that Bryce prefers Van Patten's card to mine. But wait. You ain't seen nothing. Raised lettering, pale nimbus, white. Impressive. Very nice. Mm. Let's see Paul Allen's card. Look at that subtle off white coloring. Thickness of it. Oh my god. It even has a watermark. Something wrong? Patrick? You're sweating. So uh, the first um, three modes were uh, employed um, by literature and something that cinema borrowed from literature. Um, and but what you saw that in that clip in American Psycho that it could be very different just to use a first person narrator in cinema and literature. Um, the, the, the next one, direct address, is something that is used in theater uh, first uh, and uh, you can trace it back to ancient Greek and then uh, Shakespeare. Uh, but it has been theorized by a German playwright, Bertolt Brecht. Um, so uh, in, um, in the plays of Brecht, uh, characters were showing some sort of an awareness of the, the, uh, the story uh, and, and the work that they were in. Um, so uh, like breaking the fourth wall, they were addressing the audiences directly. So they were not accepting that there is a wall, there is a barrier between uh, the actors in theater and um, the uh, the audience in the theater. So they were ad 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 um, directly addressing the audiences. Um, in cinema, actually, this, these effects can be um, kind of uh, approached in different ways. It's, it's not just the actors uh, directly speaking to cameras. So there are all uh, sort of devices from the editing and cinematography that in, in cinema they can use to, to break the fourth wall. So an example of that, um, usually uh, used in comedy, is by Woody Allen. Uh, it's something that classical Hollywood movies didn't permit uh, uh, the performance to do. Uh, so it was like in the 60s and 70s with directors, new directors in Hollywood, like Woody Allen, they started to, uh, to use these uh, Brechtian techniques. Henrietta Farrell, just Miss Perfect all the time, and, and Ivan Ackerman. Always the wrong answer. Always. Seven three is nine. Even then, I knew they were just jerks. In 1942, I had already discovered women. Let me kiss me! Kiss me! 
That's the second time this month. Step up here. What did I do? Step up here. What did I do? You should be ashamed of yourself. Why? I was just expressing a healthy sexual curiosity. Six-year-old boys don't have girls on their minds. I did. For God's sake, Sally, even Freud speaks of a latency period. Well, I never had a latency period. I can't help it. Why couldn't you have been more like Donald? Now there was a model boy. Tell the folks where you are today, Donald. I'm on a profitable dress company. Boy, sometimes I wonder where my classmates are today. I'm president of the Pinkus Plumbing Company. I sell taluses. I used to be a heroin addict. Now I'm a methadone addict. I'm into leather. Perspired and everything. Well, didn't you take a, a shower at the club? So this is another scene in the hall. So I just say, it's not always just that they, they uh, like in cinema, it's not just uh, the actors addressing the cameras, looking at the camera. There are other things that uh, a, a filmmakers uh, can employ to uh, uh, create some sort of uh, uh, awareness of uh, the um, uh, the, the fact that we're watching a movie and just break the, the, the so-called fourth wall. You know what Grammy Hall would call a real Jew? Thank you. Yeah, well, you know, she hates Jews. She thinks they just make money. But let me tell you, I mean, she's the one. And is she ever, I'm telling you. So did you do those photographs in there or what? Yeah, yeah, I sort of dabble around, you know. They're they're wonderful, you know. They have a they have a quality. Well, I I, I would like to take a serious photography course. In... Photography is interesting because you know it's a it's a new art form and a a set of aesthetic criteria have not emerged yet. Aesthetic criteria? You mean whether it's a good photo or not? The the medium enters in as a condition of the art form itself. Well. Well, uh, to me, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's all instinctive, you know? I mean, I just try to uh, feel it, you know? I try to get a sense of it and not think about it so much. It's th still, you need a set of aesthetic guidelines to put it in social perspective, I think. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I guess, I guess you must be sort of late, huh? You know what? i got to get there and begin whining soon. <laughs> Um, so the last thing is restricted narration. Uh, so uh, this is something actually we can uh, talk a little more uh, when we discuss the story and plot. Restricted narration is and then the narrator is uh, like the, the, the movie is showing uh, just limited uh, uh, aspects of the scene. So like uh, a, a typical um, uh, moment is that when the character is op opens the door, we see uh, the reaction shot shot uh, um, like he or she is shocked for example by what um, but what by, by what they see so we see that close up we see the reaction shot we know something strange or bad or shocking is inside that room that they open but it's never shown to us that's restricting our access to to uh, to certain um, uh, spaces or moments to to create uh, and complete this story. Um, there are also uh, the the issue of character uh, identifications or character engagement. We sympathize or empathize with the characters, uh, um, usually the main ones in the movies. Uh, David Bordwell believes that uh, we need a more scientific terms rather than empathy or sympathy because we don't exactly empathize or identify with characters uh, in the screen. Um, he uses these two terms, alignment and allegiance. So one is the objective perspective presented to the spectator by the camera. So if you have a central character, but certain times, certain uh, moments in a movie, uh, uh, we hear dialogues or we are present somewhere that, that the character is not there. So in the movies that we watch in this class, Casablanca, so Bogart is the, the, the central character, but there was a scene, for instance, Sam was talking to Ingrid Bergman character about the songs or the past uh, without the presence of the central character. So not, not all the information uh, to build uh, and, and complete the storylines were presented by 
the, the point of view or perspectives of the central character. Uh, allegiance, however, then uh, the, the positions of the spectators is very subjective. When we have the characters all the time uh, in uh, the situation, usually in detective films, everything is revealed to us when it's revealed uh, by, by clues that uh, uh, the detective um, uh, gains. Um, and contemporary films, we have even this uh, feeling of religion it goes to the degree that we have this eye camera things, usually in horror movies, uh, contemporary horror movies like Diary of the Dead, the Blair Witch, Proje uh, Blair Witch Project, and, uh, and popular movies like that, The Wreck. So everything uh, is presented to us by exact view uh, of uh, the, the, the character. Uh, so you don't see anyone else's perspective uh, and you don't even see that the character's face you just you're in uh, uh, his uh, viewpoint um, so I want to show two clips from Chinatown to to show um, kind of or elaborate on the differences between uh, alignment and allegiance is the film that we totally learn everything in this film through or, or the uh, the eyes of the detective, hard-boiled detective, the, the Jack Nicholson character. Uh, and um, except one or two scenes that actually uh, something is shown to us quickly. Uh, and uh, the, the camera uh, uh, stays with another character, not the main character. Usually we see everything when it's been uh, presented uh, to uh, the central character, the Jack Nicholson character. Better come with me. But why? There's nothing more to say. Will you get my car, please? Okay, go home. But in case you're interested, your husband was murdered. Somebody has been dumping thousands of tons of water from the city's reservoirs, and we're supposed to be in the middle of a drought. He found out about it, and he was killed. There's a waterlogged drunk in the morgue, involuntary manslaughter if anybody wants to take the trouble, which they don't. It seems like half the city is trying to cover it all up, which is fine by me. But Mrs. Mulray, I goddamn near lost my nose, and I like it. I like breathing through it. And I still think that you're hiding something. So you hear real instances uh, in this movie that um, the, the character leaves, the Jack Nicholson character leaves, and the camera stays with another character. Because usually we are confused um, uh, as uh, he is confused, and um, just uh, we don't get information from other characters. So it's the first time you see uh, her facial expressions is just revealed to the audience, not to the, uh, the, the characters we are aligned with. Uh, the opposite of this scene uh, uh, happens uh, in the last scene. She's mine too. She's never going to know that. Evelyn, you're a disturbed woman. You cannot hope to provide. Evelyn, put that gun away. Let the police handle this. He owns the police. Get away from her. You'll have to kill me first. Get away. Get away. Captain, close the door. So at, at this point we hear the blowing of the horn, we know something happens but the camera doesn't get there. Up to the point that the characters that we are aligned with is getting there. So we, nothing is revealed to us before the characters that uh, we are in allegiance. So with uh, breaking the fourth wall and contemporary Hollywood films, because it was something that was supposed to be very didactic, 
Um, uh, so in classical Hollywood cinema, it was not really permitted. The uh, classical Hollywood cinema, the mainstream Hollywood, uh, uh, they wanted the audience to forget that uh, they were watching the movie, to, to be kind of, um, uh, uh, in a way, uh, immersed in, in the world of the film and never really see uh, any um, uh, sort of uh, uh, any awareness uh, 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 about uh, the fact that they are watching the movie. Um, so, um, direct address is doing the opposite. And uh, so, with that direct address, characters display the awareness about the cinematic modes of production that they are in. So at the first, uh, it was considered as something um, uh, in um, European art film, this sort of breaking techniques in the films of Jean-Luc Godard. So these were not really mainstream films. And then we have uh, new American cinema directors like Woody Allen, for, uh, for, for instance, started to use that in American cinema. Uh, but contemporary Hollywood films actually uh, use that to increase the pleasure, something that was in Jean-Luc Godard films, uh, was employed uh, to uh, take away, uh, to kind of work against the, the Hollywood um, idea of increasing the, the, the uh, visual pleasure, the pleasures uh, for the, the audience to follow the story, usually ending happy ending, is to um, kind of deny that from the audience. Contemporary, uh, actually, Hollywood films and uh, actually television series, they started to use those techniques um, in order to increase the pleasure. So nowadays that technique uh, of uh, the uh, breaking the fourth wall or direct address is not as didactic as it used to be in European art films. It's actually a very common technique in mainstream films. So look at the, the next two clips. Incredible. One of the worst performances of my career and they never doubted it for a second. How could I possibly be expected to handle school on a day like this? This is my ninth sick day this semester. It's getting pretty tough coming up with new illnesses. If I go for 10, I'm probably going to have to barf up a lung. So I better make this one count. The key to faking out the parents is the clammy hands. It's a good non-specific symptom. I'm a big believer in it. A lot of people will tell you that a good phony fever is a deadlock, but uh, you get a nervous mother, you could wind up in a doctor's office. That's worse than school. You fake a stomach cramp, and when you're bent over, moaning and wailing, you lick your palms. It's a little childish and stupid, but then so is high school. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. I do have a test today. That wasn't bullshit. It's on European socialism. I mean, really, what's the point? I'm not European. I don't plan on being European. So who gives a crap if they're socialists? They can be fascist anarchists. It still wouldn't change the fact that I don't own a car. I recall Central Park in fall. How you toy a dress. What a mess, I confess. So you saw that by blocking uh, with his hand the camera, it, it knows the existence of the camera inside the shower room. So we are not, we, we know that sort of awareness of the, the uh, position of the camera and the characters is aware of the fact. So it's not just the story word that they are in. Uh, so the, usually with the voiceover, it's uh, creating some sort of ironical things. If you've seen, for instance, American Beauty. Um, remember, in the, at some point in the movie, it says that uh, this is the day, um, uh, this is the last day of the rest of my life, so I will be dead uh, tonight. So it's just, how can you be dead and at the same time um, narrate this story, for example? So this is contemporary Hollywood mainstream film stars to, started to employ um, uh, the um, uh, direct address mode 
into popular entertainment, something that we uh, never had in uh, classical Hollywood cinema. Um, the, the most important um, concepts that we should learn and for the screening quiz today is uh, the story versus plot. Story is the chronological sequence of events and plot is the uh, causal and logical structure which connects the events. Uh, the plot consists of specific action and events that the filmmaker selects and the order in which they arrange those events to effectively convey the narrative to the viewer. So there are a number of ways that the, the plot approaches the story. Usually we have a three uh, kind of um, three acts of structure, linear narrative in mainstream Hollywood films that we usually follow the story. And the plot is helping us to build the story. They, they correspond to each other pretty well. But contemporary films, films like Memento, if you've seen, uh, uh, Inception maybe, even like Mother, uh, mother is a little different. It's just something that you always, uh, the plot is a little restricted narration because the plot is always, you realize that there is something else. But films like Memento, uh, uh, Christopher Nolan's films, Irreversible, um, uh, all these films are trying to, to create some sort of um, tricks. So the plot tricks us uh, in um, kind of, in a way we construct this story. So it, it, it just always plays with the way we usually assume um, what the story is. So the, the way the plot is uh, organized uh, is like a puzzle. Uh, so uh, it's not, first of all, as easy to create that as stories. Or films like uh, Pulp Fiction, they're just, they're just uh, kind of uh, messing up. So there is a linear uh, narrative, but they're just sort of, uh, it, it's been kind of, um, destroyed. Uh, so there are also fork narratives, right? La run, lot of run. We see possibilities. So there are possible different um, narratives, uh, different stories. Uh, but if you've seen the films like Memento, uh, it's all about uh, sort of how the viewers are always um, kind of misinformed by the plot, maybe, to create the story. And it's just about um, kind of uh, this um, puzzle. So you usually need to see these movies more than once, films like Memento or uh, Irreversible, um, and uh, kind of number of actually contemporary films are playing with that sort of, um, they're trick films. Um, uh, there are films of like uh, an Iranian filmmaker, Asghar Farhadi, uh, if you've seen Separation or Passe or, um, uh, uh, from the salesman. Uh, what the plot is trying to do, you create the story, but you always realize that there is something more. So there are narrative twists that you realize the way you were building the story was not enough. Uh, there are secondary characters uh, and some uh, certain events that you think they were unimportant that uh, they started to serve purpose later. Kind of it's revealed to us that they actually are very significant. So the story is always becoming bigger and bigger, uh, unlike what we expect. Um, so uh, there are story duration, plot duration, and screen duration. So screen duration is obviously movies and running time, plot duration, uh, the, the, the uh, lapse time of uh, those events within the story that the film explicitly presents, and the story duration, the amount of time that the uh, imply the story takes to appear. Um, so in the movies that we watched for this course so far, um, there was one movie that the story plot and the screen durations were the same. That was, yes, 12 Angry Men. In 12 Angry Men, uh, so uh, the, probably the screen duration is something like 90 minutes. That was also the plot duration and the story duration. There was no flashbacks. And no um, kind of uh, cutting uh, and, and moving forward or going to a different location or anything. So everything, uh, so the plot and the story times were exactly the same. We wouldn't know any sort of background and anything, uh, any sort of thing uh, that happened after. So we never even learned the names of the, the, the characters. Uh, with a movie uh, that we watched, Casablanca, uh, the plot duration is probably is taking place in a couple of weeks when the um, um, 
Ingrid Bergman came to Casablanca and the, the events and then the, uh, the, the escape. Um, so it, it just possibly one or two weeks uh, um, or maybe a little more. That's the uh, plot duration. But the story duration is a little bit more, a little bit more, probably years. Because with the flashback that is inserted, we know some background about what happened. Uh, uh, so we know for the story from the time that Burgertz and Bergman were in love in Paris. We don't know anything from uh, about uh, prior events. Uh, so the story from, is, starts from there uh, to the end of the film. So it's more than um, probably, maybe in a couple of years. So in this scene in uh, uh, Citizen Kane, the breakfast scene, try to identify the story duration, plot duration, and the screen duration. school with Emily. I was very graceful. Uh, uh, we were talking about the first Mrs. Kane. And what was she like? She was like all the girls who knew in dancing school. Very nice girl, very nice. Emily was a little nicer. <clears throat> well, after the first couple of months, she and Charlie didn't see much of each other except at breakfast. It was a marriage just like any other marriage. Yes, you are. You're very, very beautiful. I've never been to six parties in my Extremely life. Extremely beautiful. Life. <laughs> I've never even been up this late. It's a matter of habit. I wonder what the servants will think. They'll think we enjoyed ourselves. Yes. Didn't we? I don't see why you have to go straight after the newspaper. You never should have married a newspaper man. They're worse than sailors. I absolutely adore you. Oh, Charles, even newspaper men have to sleep. I'll call Mr. Bernstein, have him put off my appointments until noon. What time is it? Oh, I don't know. It's late. It's early. Charles, do you know how long you kept me waiting last night while you went to the newspaper for ten minutes? What do you do in a newspaper in the middle of the night? Emily, my dear, your only correspondent is the Inquirer. Sometimes I think I'd prefer a rival of flesh and blood. Oh, Emily, I don't spend that much time on the newspaper. It isn't just the time. It's what you print, attacking the president. You mean Uncle John? I mean the president of the United States. He's still Uncle John. He's still a well-meaning fathead who's letting a pack of high-pressure crooks run his administration. This whole oil scandal... He happens to be the president, Charles, not you. That's a mistake that will be corrected one of these days. You, Mr. Bernstein, sent Junior the most incredible atrocity yesterday, Charles. I simply can't have it in the nursery. Mr. Bernstein is apt to pay a visit to the nursery now and then. Does he have to? Yes. Really, Charles? People will think... What I tell them to think. So the, uh, the film time or duration time is uh, 2 minutes and 38 seconds. Uh, probably uh, the plot time is just the interview started and it just takes for the interviewer to describe the whole scene. It's just probably we assume that it takes like maybe a couple of hours or something. Uh, but the story time, years, uh, distance is growing between husband and wife. First they are more intimate and then uh, so over the years... Uh, the, the, we can see the growing distance. As an example, uh, a plot uh, is different than the story. So for the screening uh, today, uh, the movie is uh, The Skin I Live In by Pedro Almodovar, um, made in 2012. Uh, so uh, you are going to discuss the relationship between the story and plot uh, in The Skin I Live In. Uh, in a short paragraph. Uh, so, uh, The Skin I Live In is, is a movie made by Pedro Almodovar. 
Pedro Almodovar was maybe the most well-known uh, Spanish uh, filmmaker uh, globally. Uh, just, I think, won awards uh, uh, in uh, prestigious festivals like Cannes and also Best Foreign Films a couple of times, uh, I think, I know, for a movie uh, all about my mother. Um, he got the Oscar for Best Foreign Film. What you see all in his films is the question of identity. So it's central uh, is the theme of identity and maybe the instability of identity. Something that you always see is that identity is not what we, uh, we, we or either gender identity uh, or uh, any other sorts of identities are not uh, the what we usually assume. So it's this uh, instability of identity is central. Uh, always in all his films so uh, it's something that because the story is and the plot is very important so watch this carefully uh, because all the narrative twists and little things uh, are carefully uh, put together in this film so you have to watch it from the beginning to end very carefully uh, so just uh, find the, the right time uh, for watching it